This is BBC News, broadcasting to viewers in the UK and around the world. I'm Martine Croxall, our top stories. The British socialite Ghislaine Maxwell is found guilty by a jury in New York on five counts of grooming and trafficking teenage girls for abuse. Maxwell procured, procured the girls for the financier and convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. She faces the rest of her life behind bars. No matter who you are, no matter what kinds of circles you traveled in, no matter how much money you have, no matter how many years have passed since the sexual abuse, justice is still possible. The World Health Organization warns coronavirus variants Omicron and Delta are driving a dangerous tsunami of cases as the US and Europe report a record number of infections. In Northern Ireland, the isolation period for people with coronavirus will be cut from 10 days to seven, provided they have a negative lateral flow test. Hello and welcome. The British socialite Ghislaine Maxwell has been found guilty of recruiting and trafficking young girls to be sexually abused by the late American financier Jeffrey Epstein. The 60-year-old was found guilty on five of the six counts she faced, including the most serious charge, that of sex trafficking a minor. Maxwell faces spending the rest of her life in prison after she was found guilty by a jury in New York, but her lawyers say they're already preparing to appeal against the conviction. Our North America correspondent, Lee McBull, reports. Court sketches show the moment Ghislaine Maxwell's victims have waited decades for. After five days of deliberation, jurors decided she was guilty on five counts linked to the sexual abuse of teenagers. And it was four of her victims who helped put her behind bars. The court heard how Ghislaine Maxwell gained their trust. During their emotional testimony, they told the jury how she instructed them to give the late Jeffrey Epstein massages that turned sexual. All but one testified anonymously, using a pseudonym or just their first name. Jane said Maxwell participated in her encounters with Epstein. I was terrified and felt gross and ashamed. When you're 14, you have no idea what's going on, she said. Kate said after meeting Epstein, Maxwell asked her if she had fun, saying she was such a good girl and one of his favourites. And Annie Farmer, the only victim who publicly identified herself, said Ghislaine Maxwell gave her an unsolicited massage. She said, I so badly wanted to get off the table and have the massage be done. She's now said she's relieved at the verdict and that it shows even those with great power and privilege will be held accountable when they sexually abuse the young. Defence lawyers attacked the accusers' memories and motives, but that ultimately didn't help Ghislaine Maxwell. We firmly believe in Ghislaine's innocence. Obviously, we are very disappointed with the verdict. We have already started working on the appeal, and we are confident that she will be vindicated. Well, Ghislaine Maxwell will be sentenced at a later date, but it seems extremely likely that she'll spend the rest of her life behind bars. A final fall from grace for the British former socialite, who a jury here has decided wasn't just a bystander to the crimes of Jeffrey Epstein, but was herself a predator and an active participant in the sexual abuse of teenagers. Police raids of Epstein's homes showed the duo's jet-setting, luxurious lifestyle. In this photo, the pair are seen relaxing at the Queen's Balmoral residence when Prince Andrew reportedly invited the couple to the estate. The staggering wealth on display from their opulent properties only highlighted how they used their power together over the years to lure, intimidate and silence everyone around them. House rules, including this manual, told staff to be deaf, dumb and blind, forbidding them from making eye contact with Epstein. One of my clients said to me that she's been living in a metaphorical prison all of these years with the psychological fallout of the sexual abuse, the deep shame and embarrassment and trauma that she's experienced. And now Ghislaine Maxwell is going to experience a real prison where she will have a lot of time to think about the profound damage that she has caused to so many girls and young women. Ghislaine Maxwell still faces a second trial for perjury, a charge which she denies. Aline McBall, BBC News in New York. 
In 1994, Liz Stein was 21 years old, a student working in New York when she met Ghislaine Maxwell, who introduced her to Jeffrey Epstein. She says the two of them assaulted her. She told BBC Radio 4 about her experience. You may find her story distressing. I was working, doing an internship at a well-known uh, Fifth Avenue retailer. And Ghislaine Maxwell came in one day. And I helped her. And she was just electrifying, you know, from almost the moment that we met. It just seemed like we hit it off. She was absolutely magnetic. And we talked about, you know, several things while she was shopping that day. It was a, a really easy conversation that I had with her. Um, and... When she was done shopping, I offered to deliver her packages to her, which is something that I would frequently do for high-end clients. But I had a hard and fast rule, and that was I didn't deliver to anyone personally. I would only drop off to hotel concierge or to doormen. So when I called to arrange to deliver her packages that evening, um, I was instructed to bring them to a hotel in Midtown Manhattan that was close by to the store. And I dropped them at the concierge. And when I arrived at the concierge, um, I was told that Ghislaine was in the bar area and that she was with someone that she wanted me to meet. So I went into the bar area and the person that she wanted me to meet was. Epstein, who she had described to me as her boss, her boyfriend. I wasn't really clear what his role was in her life. So I met Epstein that evening, and that was the first time they assaulted me. At the hotel? Yes. Liz Stein. Well, Ghislaine Maxwell's legal team has been contacted by the BBC to put Liz Stein's accusations to them and we await a response. Adam Klasfeld is a US legal news reporter who's been covering the courthouse where the Epstein and Maxwell stories unfolded for more than a decade, and uh, we can speak to him now. Adam, thank you very much for joining us. What's the reaction been to this outcome in New York? Well, this is a historic verdict. As I have said before, this is a case that is a quarter century in the making. The indictment talks about events that happened in 1994 to 2004. And there has been a long awaited reckoning and an emphatic verdict, as you said, for five of six counts of guilty, including on the top count, sex trafficking a minor, which standing alone could have a maximum sentence of 40 years imprisonment, effectively a life sentence if sentenced on the maximum penalty. So it's something that People who have been covering this court have been closely monitoring. As a matter of fact, the civil suit that was a real catalyst behind it, the civil suit of Virginia Giuffre against Glenn Maxwell unfolded in the same court, the Southern District of New York. And it was from that case that it was mentioned a little bit earlier that there is a pending perjury count. That's a perjury, two perjury counts from deposition testimony that Glenn Maxwell gave in that case. So that gives a sense of the scale and the historical importance of and impact of this verdict. What was her reaction? Because she's been a very sort of calm and collected person throughout. Yes, throughout the trial, she's been very calm, collected, engaged with her defense. Uh, sometimes uh, b bantering uh, with her attorneys and acknowledging her siblings who are usually seated in the front row. She, her sang froid and her calm continued uh, uh, when the verdict was was read. Uh, apparently, there was, it was said that she had, after the five out of six guilty verdicts were pronounced, she had poured a little uh, cup of water from her Fiji water bottle. And that was in keeping of the Glenn Maxwell that I saw in the courtroom throughout. This was someone who, even facing the possibility of the rest of her life in prison, has reacted with calm, without emotion.
A great deal of credit given to the, the, the witnesses and the, the bravery in them coming forward to give testimony. But the defence say that they are preparing an appeal. What are the chances of it succeeding? Well, experts that I've trust have always uh, have already said that it's a long shot. We don't know what the appeal will say. Uh, we know that they've been saying from the beginning that uh, this was a it was impossible for Glenn Maxwell to get a fair trial because of the massive media attention. We I sat through a jury voir dire and this was a jury that was screened for media coverage. They didn't seem to uh, know much about the case at all. And as a matter of fact, uh, these deliberations, uh, the verdict came down on its sixth day. Uh, they had been scrutinizing the evidence, including the defense presentation of the case. The same day that the verdict came down, they requested the defense's key expert witness. And and that was the witness who tried to call the memories of all of these victims into question. And that failed. Uh, at the end of the day, five of six guilty counts. So who knows what will happen? We will see what her appeal says. But the people who uh, who I trust as experts do feel that it is a long shot. Adam Klasfeld, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. COVID rules are to be toughened up across a number of European countries. Austria has revealed it plans to make vaccines mandatory for everyone over 14, with non-compliance punishable with a €3,000 fine every three months. Germany has new restrictions on sporting events and nightclubs, while some countries have banned dancing and music. The restrictions come as more European countries have reported record numbers of infections and people are asked to be cautious ahead of New Year's celebrations. Well, we've been speaking to Dr. Catherine Smallwood, the World Health Organization's senior emergency officer for Europe, and she says the Omicron variant is causing a surge of cases in Western Europe, but it may not be as severe. Well, we're seeing a very, very rapid increase in the number of new COVID-19 cases. Of course, we expected that anyway because of the holiday season. But uh, with the rapid spread of Omicron, we're seeing that very much accelerated, and that's especially in Western Europe where we're seeing countries like the United Kingdom, France, Denmark, Portugal, Spain, Italy, all seeing cases now outstripping what they've seen at any previous time during the pandemic. And it's early days yet, but that's significantly um, going to put health systems under pressure. It's going to lead to a lot of people being hospitalized and it's going to lead to a lot of disruption. There's also been a surge of Omicron cases in the United States, prompting the health authorities to offer warnings about hospital capacity. Dr. Andrew Pasteski is the ICU medical director at Florida's Jackson South Medical Center, and we can speak to him now. Uh, thank you for joining us on BBC News. Florida then seeing an increase in cases with record numbers uh, each day recently. What do you attribute this new surge to? Oh, well, it's absolutely Omicron. Um, <clears throat> Omicron is now uh, 80 to 90 percent of the cases here in the Jackson Health System. Uh, it has just jumped and, and spread like wildfire in the last few weeks. We had we were feeling really good down to two COVID cases just a, a few weeks ago. And now we have 60 today. And that is a spike and a surge that we have not seen anything like that in any of Delta or any of this before. It has never been that fast. We were all expecting something after the holidays, but not this spike before the holidays. And now what's coming is even scarier. How many of those people suffering and being hospitalized are vaccinated? So it's, it's looking like about 30% are vaccinated. Most of the sick ones are unvaccinated or have not been boosted or have significant uh, comorbidities. I have not seen many vaccinated, boosted, sick people. None of them are in the ICU right now. But we are seeing in people who have not been boosted that they are coming to the hospital with sick COVID symptoms. What does it mean, though, if, the, as you say, the majority of them are Omicron cases? Um, we don't know as much about this variant yet as, as many medics would like to, but does it mean that you think that the cases will be less severe? I had hoped that in the beginning we were not admitting as often as we were with Delta, but we, ha you know, if, if the number of cases are so high that even if it's a smaller percentage of cases that get sick, but we're still seeing them, it's going to still be overwhelming. And at our peak, uh, at, at our absolute worst, we were sitting at about 110 COVID cases. 
And that was a good two months into that surge. That was Delta. To be at 60 cases just a few weeks into this surge and with the holidays just having happened and not contributing to this surge, it's going to be it's going to be worse again. I, I, it's just it's it's so frustrating. What will stop the spread then? If, in, as you said, in some cases, people are already vaccinated. So like we've seen in South Africa, this will probably burn out. Uh, hopefully just as quickly as it uh, as it spiked. That's what we saw in South Africa. But there is still going to be that time where this is going to be absolutely difficult on the health system. Uh, I mean, we're seeing half the ER turning positive. My ICU team, I've had six people already get, uh, turn positive. Fortunately, with the CDC's guidelines and the vaccine mandates, it's only a five day quarantine now if you're better. So that's helping with the, the staff issues. But the, the hope is that this will burn out just as fast as it has in South Africa. If not, it's going to be a whole bunch of cases of people waiting in the parking lots to be seen again. Dr. Andrew Pesteski from um, the uh, Jackson South Medical Center in Florida. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. In England and Wales, there were 33 fewer deaths with coronavirus in the latest recorded week, according to the Office for National Statistics. It's the lowest number of deaths since the middle of October. The number of deaths involving COVID-19 has now been falling since mid-November. However, the ONS says the number of deaths in total in the UK was 14% above the five-year average. Meanwhile, coronavirus surge hubs are being set up at NHS uh, hospitals in England to deal with potential, in an inc potential increase in admissions caused by that record daily case number of uh, Omicron coronavirus variant. Eight sites will be able to treat around 100 patients each. At the same time, the Health Secretary Sajid Javid says the supply of lateral flow tests will be tripled in January and February to try to combat shortages. Well, joining us now to talk about how the health service is uh, preparing to cope is Chris Hopson, Chief Executive of NHS Providers. Thank you very much for joining us on BBC News. In the previous uh, stages of the pandemic, we saw so-called Nightingale Hospital set up, which didn't get used, it appeared. Um, how do these hubs differ? Well, so in both cases, um, they're about a back pocket insurance policy such that if we get on the end of a really, really big surge in numbers of uh, patients needing treatment, we are able to treat them. We saw some very distress distressing scenes, didn't we, very early on in um, in COVID-19 over in Lombardy, where it was very, you know, you could see patients couldn't get the care that they needed. So this is a no regrets um, preparation for uh, a, a, a large surge should it happen. So the re and the, the question you asked was how are they different? Well, I think one of the things I think we feel we've learnt um, over uh, the pandemic is the need to co-locate this capacity with existing hospitals. Uh, and so therefore, instead of having them separately in conference centres, and obviously the advantage of using conference centres and places like that is that you can get lots of capacity, what we're doing this time is ensuring that um, the extra capacity is actually physically located on a hospital site, which should make uh, medical supervision easier to achieve this time. How are you going to staff them, though? Because we keep hearing how much pressure NHS hospitals are under already for doctors and nurses and other ancillary staff. <sighs> Well, it, all of this links together, and there's three bits of the chain that I think we need to understand. The first is these are a back pocket insurance policy. We're preparing for the worst, but hoping for the best and hoping that we won't have to use them. But if we are going to use them, they will be used in an emergency. The second bit in the chain is to understand what they'd be used for, and that is they won't be used for providing care to really seriously ill patients. What they would be used for is patients who've already been treated, but we still need to oversee them and supervise them for say 24, 36, 48 hours longer. So in, in, in that sense, we're hoping that people will be over the worst, but they're not quite ready to go home yet. 
but we need to kind of keep an eye on them. And then the third bit then is that if, if we are actually going to be using these, we will be in an emergency. We will be on a war footing, uh, to use the phrase that the Chief Medical uh, England, NHS England's Chief Medical Officer used. So we will be using an emergency staffing model, which means that, for example, we will be pulling in, asking volunteers from the voluntary sector, we'll be asking for um, recently retired uh, medical staff to join us. Because I think we all recognise that we wouldn't be able to staff this existing capacity from um, our existing staff for exactly the pressures that you are describing. However, the advantage that you've got here is that you would be able to, for example, have some time from very senior medical uh, you know, consultants and doctors who would be able to keep an eye on what was going on um, in this extra capacity. But because of the needs of the patients, they're not the most illest patients, then you would be able to staff it in an emergency way by using, as I said, for example, volunteers or um, asking people who've recently retired to come back and help. But we'd be able to do that because we're in an emergency. Finally and briefly, if you would, uh, how likely is it, though, that if there is this surge, we'll see yet again non-COVID cases that might be regarded as urgent won't get seen by medics? Well, what's very striking is whenever I talk to a hospital chief executive at the moment, they absolutely recognise that there are some um, of those delayed planned care cases where, which we simply cannot delay any longer. So the bit I'd really want to assure you uh, and your viewers is that we are doing everything we can to treat those most urgent cases because we know they can't be put off any longer. And hospitals are performing a very delicate juggling act at the moment where they're trying to get through as many of those cases as possible, whilst at the same time preparing for a surge should that occur. Chris Hobson from NHS Providers, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Northern Ireland's devolved government has decided to reduce the self-isolation period for people with coronavirus from 10 days to seven, provided they have negative lateral flow tests on the sixth and seventh days. The change will take effect from tomorrow. Let's speak to our Ireland correspondent, Chris Page. What's brought this about, Chris? Well, ministers in the devolved government here at Stormont have had a virtual meeting today where they have received the latest briefing from their scientific advisers about the COVID situation in this part of the UK. And until very recently, it had been the case that Omicron wasn't spreading here quite as rapidly as in England uh, and Scotland, uh, certainly. But that has now changed. Ministers were told that more than 90% of COVID cases in Northern Ireland are now accounted for by Omicron. The daily case numbers uh, for today uh, say that 4,700 or thereabouts positive cases have been recorded in the last 24 hours. And that means the infection rate has never been higher throughout the whole course of the pandemic. The number of people in hospital with COVID is also rising. It went up from 277 uh, to just over 300 in the last 24 hours. However, those hospital admissions are not rising uh, at the rate that would be necessary in Minister's view to necessitate new public health restrictions. Restrictions were tightened here earlier this week. So from Monday, uh, for example, nightclubs uh, have been closed also some more changes for the wider hospitality industry. It's been back to the rule of six, uh, no more than six people at a table, uh, and it's table service only. Uh, ministers today had been considering whether to restrict attendance at sporting events, but they've decided not to go ahead with that and not to uh, impose any further restrictions. One change has been brought in. That is, as regards self-isolation, if you test positive for COVID, well, you don't have to self-isolate for 10 days anymore. You have to self-isolate for seven days, provided that you do a lateral flow test on the sixth and seventh day and those tests come back with a negative result. So that is designed to try to ease some of the potential pressure on workforces across Northern Ireland as the Omicron variant spreads with people having to take time off work. Ministers say they are going to keep all the data under review and they're going to meet again in a week's time on the 6th of January. Chris, thank you very much. Chris Page in Northern Ireland. Foreign Office officials are seeking clarification from the French authorities on travel rules for British citizens with homes in the EU. After passengers travelling on the Eurotunnel shuttle services between Britain and France and on P&O ferries were told they were banned from travelling through France. Most British tourists and business people are already banned from travelling to France because of Britain's high Covid infections. A coroner has given a verdict at the inquest into the death of the Liverpool Women's Hospital bomber Emad al-Swayalmin. 
a, a narrative conclusion which was reached that Swail Mean died in a taxi in front of the hospital from an explosion and subsequent fire caused by an improvised explosive device which he carried into the vehicle. It's said that he had manufactured the device with murderous intent. China has hit out at the US, Canada and the EU after they condemned the arrest of seven Hong Kong journalists on Wednesday as part of China's wider crackdown on press freedom in the region. A foreign ministry spokesperson said the criticism was irresponsible and was trying to mislead public opinion. Presidents Biden and Putin are to hold another phone call later today as the US tries to build a common response with Europe to Russia's massing of troops on the Ukrainian border. A Biden administration official said the two men would discuss a range of security and strategic issues. The coffin of the South African anti-apartheid hero Archbishop Desmond Tutu is lying in state in St George's Cathedral in Cape Town. Large crowds are expected to visit to pay their respects before Archbishop Tutu's funeral on Saturday, with memorials also planned in Johannesburg and Pretoria. The James Webb Space Telescope, which launched last week, is starting to unfold its sunshield in a complex process involving hundreds of moving parts. The world's most powerful telescope went into space on Christmas Day.